os quatro we're going to present all our four uh, so that we can start the presentation properly and then we can start our debate at the end of the presentations okay so the first person to speak today will be Luis Fernando Tamarzi he is a physician and a veterinary by University of Birlandia, and he is a PhD in animal husbandry and also a master in animal sciences by Ezalki. He has been working for over 20 years in nutrition, animal nutrition is me. He is working now as a consultant, and starting 2000, he has been working with Ertuga, working in our technical and sales areas. And then in 2018, he took over the management of research and development in our company in 2003 by after the operations of PSM taking over Tortuga. He has started working with all Latin American and starting 2019, he has become the global director of Ruminant Science and he is now working in Swiss where he is now connecting to us here today. The second speaker will be Dr. Dr. Rodrigo de Almeida, who is a veterinary by the University of Paraná. He has a master's in animal science by McGill University in Canada. He's also a PhD in animal science and pastor by Zalki, and currently he is a professor in the Department of Animal Husbandry and an advisor in the get grad programs in the University of Paraná, where he is also the coordinator of Grupo de Leite. Rodrigo, besides all that, is also a consultant in Derricado in the south of Brazil. Our third speaker, who is talking to us straight from the U.S., is a professor of physiology in the Department of Animal Science of the University of Florida, and he comes from a dairy cattle farm in Minnesota. He is a PhD in biochemistry and immunobiology by Iowa State University and Wisconsin University. He has been working in the University of Florida since 2013, in which he has studied nutrition, metabolism, and gene expression of vitamin D in cattle. And last but not least, Dr. Mario who is a specialist in animal husbandry and animal nutrition pastor by Azalke, and he's a PhD in animal husbandry also by UNESCO. Currently, he is a professor in the Department of Animal Improvements and Nutrition in the School of Animal Husbandry and Veterinary, and he also works with animal nutrition with a focus in feedlots of young yearlings and additives and supplements of animal diet. He's also a researcher in animal nutrition since 2009, and he works in nutrition since, he has been working there since 2007. So now we're going to start our event, and I will be showing you a short video so that you can understand what is the D technology we're presenting to you today. Prepare-se para conhecer a tecnologia D que conecta a nutrição ao resultado. HiD é uma tecnologia ativa de alta absorção que potencializa a ação da vitamina D e todos os seus benefícios essenciais para uma produção superior de carne e leite. Veja quais são. Incremento de ganho de peso. Maior rendimento de carcaça. Longevidade com máxima performance por toda a vida da vaca. Melhora a produção do leite. Bem-vindos à nova era da produtividade. Increase in milk yield. Welcome to the age of highly productive operations. Tortuga, a DSM brand. Great, so now I'd like to invite to be our first speaker, Mr. Luis Fernando, the director of innovation in ruminant science at DSM. Good evening, doctor. Hi, Juliana. Good evening. Good evening to everyone who is here with us today. It's a pleasure to have you all here with us. 
Bom dia para o pessoal. And I like to also say good morning to other people who are on the other side of the world. I know that we have people that are connected in China, Australia, and other countries. So I'd like to thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to get all of you here. I hope we have a very productive meeting. And we want to show you a really innovative technology that is the D technology that will definitely help milk and meat production around the globe. The first will start sell in the Americas. This product is already available now in South America, Central America and North America. And soon enough, we will be uh, releasing the product in other countries like Australia, New Zealand, and we'll be working with some of the results we have obtained recently and what this technology is all about, why it is so innovative. To get things started, I'd like to raise a few questions that I feel are very important to us. When we talk about meat production, milk production, Things are not as simple as they seem sometimes. There are several challenges we have to face. Sometimes animal health, management, nutrition, metabolic disorders. All of that is part of milk and meat produce, producing operations. So we have to pay close attention to several factors that are definitely really important. And the topic we'll be talking today when we talk about dairy cattle and beef cattle, is especially focused on the relationship we have to build between mineral me metabolism, for example, calcium and phosphorus with animal production. These are very important minerals. And my question is, can we adjust this metabolism in order to m optimize production? A second important question is, both for dairy cattle and beef cattle, we have to promote animal health because healthy animals produce more milk and more milk. That is something we have to always keep in mind when we talk about animal production. There's another factor that is a bit more technical, a little more accurate, I'd say. That is the ability to manipulate or better, induce gene expressions in order to produce more or prevent or, sorry, enhance the development of our animals. All of this has to be connected to responsibility. Animal raising now is much different from what it used to be now, and we have to be sustainable. So now we have to keep an eye on what uh, everything we can do, what are all the technologies we can implement to produce more, better, but more sustainably. And last but not least, farmers must, at the end of their operations, have profits. They ha must have profitable operations. So all the technology that we introduce in the market must bring re a return on investment. So all of that is connected in our sustainability platform at DSM, where we work with how we can replace antibiotics, how we can improve nutrient utilization, how we can protect the environment. For example, we can better use natural resources, for example, food and water. All of that is part of a comprehensive context in which we introduce our technologies, like the technology we'll be introducing today, that is a D technology that is inserted very precisely in this context. Very well. So, to start talking about dairy cattle, I'd like to show you these two graphs that say that today we have a great challenge ahead of us, that is cattle longevity. In these two graphs, to see the reality around the globe. On the left, we have the Actually, not the pregnancy rate. Here is the replacement rate. So what we want is an average replacement rate of 25 to 30 percent. But we see that there are some countries that have a replacement rate that is much higher than that. That means that we can improve the, those operations. And on the right, we have the average number of calvings. That means 
how many lactations a cow goes through throughout her, her, uh, its lifetime. And the global average is below three lactations. And we know that we need at least two or three lactations so that we can cover the costs of this cow from birth to culling. That means that both the replacement rate and the average number of calvings are important parameters when we want to think about improving our cattle raising operations. These two graphs that you see now, they are dealing with the same thing but using two different sources. On the left, we have the USDA in the US publishing on 2007 the major reasons for early culling. And on the right, IFCN in 2017, so most much more recently, with a similar study. And regardless of the percentages that you see here that are a bit different, we see that most cows who are culled are culled due to problems associated with diet and health or productivity. All of that allows us to think that we have to find new alternatives, we have to find innovative technology so that we can have the tools to have us address these problems directly so that we can improve productivity. The solution is up to us and we can improve all these factors. And now we'll be showing something that is a bit more accurate. A dairy cow has a transition period that is the critical part of the production. When the cow gives birth to a calf, it demands calcium for the production of colostrum and milk. So there is a drop, a significant drop, in the serum calcium that is circulating in the bloodstream of the cow or the heifer when it's the, a permaperous cow. This le leads to critical levels of calcium. For example, when it's below 8.5 milligrams per decil, we reach uh, levels in which the cow shows hypocalcemia, sometimes subclinical hypocalcemia, which means that we have lower levels of calcium what, than what's recommended and required for the cow health. And when it's below 4, these are extreme low levels with clinical manifestations. And when you have low calcium in serum, that also reduces cell activity, which harms the immunity of these animals. So if we want to keep these immune systems uh, up, because otherwise we would have severe pro problems, we have to increase those levels. So here I want to give you some context of what we have to address, what are the problems we have to tackle to improve productivity, and what are some of the factors we have at hand that we can solve to improve production in our own operations. Here in this graph that was elaborated by uh, McGrath, a very a great researcher in Australia, we can see that after of birth, we see some calcium reserves. However, these calcium reserves are, they drop after some time. So it's difficult for cows to replenish these reserves throughout calvings and lactations. After the third calving, for example, we see even higher drops in calcium reserves. So this is a fundamental point to be addressed. How can I increase calcium reserves in subsequent calvings and lactation periods to minimize the risk of low calcium levels leading to health issues and therefore early culling? Very well. At the end, one of the goals that we have here, and we have several goals, but one of it is to increase the name of lactations. That is, what we want is this cow to be more productive throughout its lifetime, from birth to culling and a natural culling, preferably. That is, as far as possible from today. We want longevity. We want 
this cow to have as many lactations as possible because a cow after the second or third lactation produces more than a heifer. That's why it's important for us to have the strategies to maintain this cow in our herd so that we can improve productivity throughout uh, the cow's lifetime. Now, when we talk about beef cattle, there are several objectives that uh, we can use to improve our operation. But it's important to highlight for us here today uh, the opportunities we have when producing more meat and more cactus. How can we handle and optimize gene expression, that is, and the cell level of the muscles and the carcass, how can we ex increase the expression to improve growth, cell growth, and lead to more meat, more carcass, higher dressing percentages, and of course, in, uh, promote optimal use of available resources so that we can manage these herds better to really lead these animals to produce uh, the most they can. Okay, so one of the important tools that we have here in this whole system that we have been talking about, uh, all the challenges we face uh, with the dairy cattle, beef cattle, and prepartum operations, everything we can to do to prepare the cows to have good calvins. Vitamin D, vitamin D3 especially, is an important important nutrient. Vitamin D3 is connected, for example, to the development and bone structure and maintenance of this bone structure. And it also is connected to the calcium and phosphorus homeostasis. Vitamin D also plays an important role in activating immune receptors in the immune cells so that the animal is prepared to fight disease. It also promotes gene activation for muscle development and consequently it also plays a role in the hormone secretion. We'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. That means that the advantage of good vitamin D levels lead to better calcium and phosphorus metabolism and improve the growth of calves, enhance animal development and muscle development activate the immune responses so that they can produce more meat or yield more milk. And you can see here, we're not going to go much into detail here, but what are some of the systems in which vitamin D acts to optimize the immune system, the mineral metabolism, and the muscle development? So vitamin D is an extremely important element in animal nutrition, especially cattle nutrition. And how does that work? Well, now we have to go into detail on how this metabolism takes place in the animal's body. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but I think it's part for you to understand it so that we can understand what is hiding. What does it do? So what we start with is, there are two main ways for uh, any animal body, people, cattle, all animals, to have proper levels of vitamin D so that we can perform our metabolic processes. The first one is, all of us, when we are exposed to solar, to the sun, we can synthesize vitamin D in our skin. But this synthesis is limited. We can synthesize a little bit of it, but it doesn't always fulfill all our needs. And the same thing happens to animals. A cow, high performance cows or high performance beef cattle, they have a high demand of vitamin D. And sometimes that's not uh, fulfilled only by being exposed to solar light. And the second thing we can do then is to have dietary vitamin D that comes from food, from the feed that usually contain vitamin D, usually vegetables, and also through vitamin supplements that may come through mineral supplements or other uh, additional factors. When this vitamin enters 
the nutrition system, that means the diet, it will be absorbed, it will reach the blood flow, and it will go through the liver in which will be transformed through a metabolic process into a process called 25-hydroxyvitamin D3 or 25-hydroxychloroquine. So that means that it's not vitamin D3 that it was seen originally in the food or was synthesized by the sun, by, by solar light in your skin. So it was metabolized. After that, 25 hydroxy uh, vitamin D, it will go to the kidneys, in which will be metabolized once again into 125 dehydroxy vitamin D3, that is the active form of vitamin D. This one, 125 dehydroxy D, vitamin D3, is the substance that modulates the intestines to absorb higher levels of calcium when animals eat. And in the case of dairy cattle, it mobilizes calcium in bone structure. So here we have something interesting about it, all of this. What about the liver? Can the liver synthesize and metabolize vitamin D3 um, in levels that are needed by the animals? No. Here is the first bottleneck we have to face in high-performance cattle operations. The liver cannot metabolize all vitamin D3 that is circulating in the bloodstream of the animal. And high D, that is the product we are presenting to you today, is precisely that. It is 125-hydroxy uh, D3 that is the component that has already been metabolized. So we are skipping this bottleneck and raising cal um, the, the vitamin levels to animals more directly and efficiently. So high D is vitamin D after metabol being metabolized. Very well. And then what we see at the end, what we, well, we want both a beef cattle and uh, feedlots or semi-confinant and dairy cattle that have high performance throughout their lifetime. So, but we have here at DSM a platform of optimal performance throughout the animal's lifetime that is based on six different tenets. That is the redox balance, uh, uh, being antibiotic free, improving skeletal development, using uh, nutrients properly, animal welfare, and consequently, protecting the environment. Very well. So, just for you to understand, I'm going to mention here a suggestion for you to read this paper that the deal addresses very uh, well in further detail the, these goals that we are presenting to you to work with animals in our different platforms so that we can optimize their performance throughout the animal's lifetime. Very well. When we talk about uh, dairy cattle more specifically, and we see that there are many challenges in these operations, one of the challenges is what we call the transition period, 20, 21 days after calving. But to talk into more detail about these critical periods, I'd like to invite Professor Rodrigo Almeida from the University of Paraná, who is an expert in this area, and will be talking to us a bit more about uh, this important period in the cow's life. Rodrigo, please, the floor is yours now. Thank you, Luis Fernando. Thank you for all, all of you for being here. Good evening to all of you. First, I'd like to thank DSM for inviting me to be here with you today and for the opportunity to talk to you, especially about hypocalcemia in dairy cattle. Hypocalcemia is a problem that we have seen for a long time, but it became more important in the past few years because it seems that hypocalcemia now is a disease that triggers other disorders. So there is a cascade of events and cows that present hypocalcemia, even if it's subclinical and in early lactation, these cows are under higher risk of developing other disorders. And that's why I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come here and talk a little bit more about such an important topic. 
In the next slide, I will be presenting to you why dairy cows are so susceptible to hypocalcemia, both clinical and subclinical in early lactation. When we think about a 600 kilograms a cow, we estimate 8, 8.5 kilograms of calcium in its body. So we see we have a lot of calcium. The problem is that 98, 99% of that calcium is on the cow's bones and teeth. So it has a plastic function and it cannot be mobilized quickly. It's not available for the cow when the cow needs it. Not only that, but there's a second limitation. Between, well, among this 1% that is not present in bones or teeth, we also have a higher concentration of calcium in the cells, inside the cells. And this cow cannot be used readily either. And in the bloodstream, we have only 3 uh, to 3.5 grams of calcium in the whole bloodstream of the cow. The cow. And there's a last limitation that is in this 8 to 9 milligrams of calcium, sorry, we have only 40 45 percent of calcium that is ionized. That is the calcium that can be readily used by cows. So you see that from the total calcium that we have, at the end, we have a very little amount of calcium that can be used by the cow whenever it needs, especially after calving. When we think about 1.2 grams of calcium per kilogram of milk, or in the case of colostrum, a concentration that is almost double that, 2.3 grams per kilogram, if we do a simple math here and we imagine that a cow, after being milked for the first time, is, is producing 8 kilograms of colostrum, so 8 times 2.3 grams leads to a demand in this first milking of 18.4 grams, that is six times the available concentration in serum, the 3.5 3 grams of ionized calcium that we mentioned earlier. So we see that with this simple math, that we can understand that we probably see almost all dairy cows, especially those that are high performing, are very susceptible to uh, suffering from hypocalcemia. This problem is present here in Brazil and in all the different uh, farms in our country. So here in this slide, I'd like to show you some of the results we have seen in the Grupo de Leite at the University of Paraná, things that we have been studying for five years. So here we have a summary of eight different experiments. So in the first column, we have the names of the researchers, people I advise in the grad uh, program, I coordinate. In the second column, we have the number of herds and where they were um, raised. In the third one, we have the number of cows that were monitored in each experiment, both primiparous or motiparous cows. And then we have the total number at the end. And in the last column, we have the incidence of hypocalcemia in each experiment. I'd like to draw your attention to two details here. The first one is the heterogeneity of results. You see that we have some very high numbers and lo very low numbers. So this leads to very heterogeneity that's usually explained by the number of collections you conduct to, to monitor the hypocalcemia. That is, the more you look for it, the more you find it. Of course, in the experiment in which we have 70, 80 percent of incidents, we collected um, samples many times to see if at any point cows presented or manifested this problem. The second thing I'd like you to pay attention to is that if we compile all these studies, when we add all of them up and all the population of cows that were assessed, we have 1,600 cows that were monitored and we found an average instance of 51 percent of of both clinical and subclinical hypocalcemia, even though subclinical was obviously much higher. Another thing we have to pay attention to is that this high incidence of hypocalcemia was found 
even when we used a threshold of eight milligram per docile, that is a conservative amount because if we used the 8.6 milligrams, these rates that are already very high would be even higher. So yes, this is a very common problems in dairy cattle operations, at least in the area where we monitor these cows. Here in this next slide, I'd like to share with you a paper by Dr. Nelson that shows the status of vitamin D that Luis Fernando just mentioned to you. So here in this paper, we saw that 642 samples were collected in 10 different dairy cattle herds in the US. These herds were supplemented with vitamin D, like the, the regular one, let's say, cocosephrol. And these herds were supplemented with 30 to 50,000 units of vitamin D daily. And you can see here that you see also high heterogeneity in the concentrations of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. If we consider that the threshold, the minimum threshold is four, in these cows we see, we can say a relatively proper level in most cows, but it's important to say here that these cows were we had were some cows that had just uh, given birth to their calves alongside ca cows that had been in lactation for many, many days. So I think it's important for us to differentiate cows that are in early lactation and late cow uh, lactation, showing that um, the concentration in these cows is very different. Those that are in our lactation show very lower, much lower levels. Back to the idea of hypoglycemia and bringing some other studies on this topic. On the left, you can see that we have an incidence of hypocalcemia that is distributed differently in, according to CABIS. But you see that multiparous cows with three, four, five lactations, that the incidence of hypercalcemia, especially this clinical one, is much higher. The incidence of milk, of milk fever is also higher, and it becomes a problem in late lactation. And in this paper, we also use the concentration of, uh, and most that were, uh, that was generally here on the rock now have a you can study that is a journal researcher who sh shows us how we have these two tools acidogenic diets and high supplementation benefiting from one another so here we have the ionized calcium concentration starting from day minus four up to day four and you can see that the higher concentrations of ionized calcium are found in treatments where the technology of acidogenic diet was adopted alongside high D supplementation. That is the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, showing that these two tools work together very well. And then here in this table on the bottom, we can see the results showing benefits in milk yield and the reduction of disease as well. But I want to address this very uh, well, much into detail because Coro Nelson will be talking about that for uh, later on. And now in my last slide to uh, finish my presentation, I have here a study by an Australian researcher showing how powerful ID is especially in retaining mineral absorption, especially calcium and phosphorus. So see, when we compare animals that were supplemented by high D and uh, with animals that didn't receive that, so were in the control group, you see that animals that were supplemented saw higher retention, so four grams of retention of calcium extra and 
3 and phosphorus, showing that we, it led to higher mineral absorption and mineral retention in the animals that were fed with high D. With that, I'd like to thank the opportunity for being here, and I'd like to lose Fernando to have the floor back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo. Your explanation was very uh, important to us. It's important for us to understand everything that is involved in the prepartum period in dairy cow. Now, moving on, we have uh, decided, well, DSM and Tortuga are always working really hard, so we are, we conducted several studies with the University of Florida. So we had five different studies in the past years in preparatory cows, lactating cows, calves, and heifers. We also conduct, we have ongoing research as well with heifers so that we can understand with scientific data and robust experiments, what are the potential benefits of high D in these uh, cows to replace some conventional vitamin D in their diet. So here in this slide, I summarize everything we found in uh, the in this research, especially throughout these five years in uh, which we have been working hard with that. So the first one is when you have a supplement of 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 or high D, we see higher levels of serum, uh, calcium in the blood, and with that, we increase total calcium and ionized calcium in the serum, both before and after calving. That results in better phosphorus and magnesium metabolism. And what does that bring to us as benefits? Well, first, it brings direct and indirect benefits for the immune system. It increases milk yield and it increases the longevity of the cow. Very, uh, we will be showing you the results and you see that have significant uh, improvements, especially with anionic diets. When associated to anionic diets, high D has even better results. And to talk to more about that in detail, our I'd like to invite to Professor Corey Nelson, who is the leading researcher in the University of Florida, who conducted all these studies to talk to us a bit more about all of them. Corey, please welcome to our discussion. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the results we found in our studies? Uh, thank you, Luis. And, uh, I will present uh, several slides now uh, several that done here at the University of Florida. The first slide I will present shows the that high D is more effective than colocalciferol at increasing the concentrations of 25 hydroxy D in serum. Again, 25 hydroxy vitamin D is the precursor to the active vitamin D hormone. So in this experiment, we fed lactating cows, uh, 60 lactating cows. We fed them either one milligram or three milligrams of colocalciferol or high D. And so you can see in the plot that uh, cows that were fed the colocalciferol as represented by the dashed lines and open symbols, uh, their serum concentrations of 25 hydroxy D in serum did not go above 100 nanograms per mil. Whereas cows that were fed the one milligram of high D or the three milligrams of high D increased to 150 nanograms per mil or three, 200 nanograms per mil in the case of three milligrams. So again, this shows that high D is much more effective than colocalciferol at increasing the concentrations of 25 hydroxy D in serum. The next slide I will show you is from an experiment we did with 177 transition cows. We had 133 multiparous cows and we had uh, 44 primiparous cows. And we started feeding 
high D, either high D or colocalciferol at uh, 242 days of gestation. So approximately four weeks before calving. Then we looked at uh, milk production, postpartum uh, calcium status, and uh, health of these animals. So you can see in this first plot here that uh, by feeding high D compared with the colocalciferol, we had greater concentrations of calcium in the postpartum period of, for these cows, as represented by the, the cows with the open symbols and dashed line where the cows fed the high D. In this same study, we also looked at milk production. And uh, so cows that were fed the, the uh, three milligrams of high D had the greatest amount of milk production. They produced uh, on average four kilograms greater milk in, during the first 42 days of lactation compared with uh, feeding three milligrams of colocalciferol during that time. So again, feeding the three milligrams high D increased milk production in these cows. We saw very similar results in an earlier experiment where we used 80, uh, premium par or 80 uh, transition cows. In this uh, experiment, we had uh, 52 multiparous cows and 28 primiparous cows. This is an experiment that was uh, led by Dr. Jose Santos here at the University of Florida. And we have three publications from the experiment, uh, one by Rodney et al. and two by Martinez et al. And the, the data I'm showing here reports of milk production in these cows. So again, we fed cows either three milligrams of colocalciferol or three milligrams of high D for 21 days prepartum. And we also combine that with uh, either positive or negative DCAD in the prepartum ration. So we had four treatments uh, with a positive negative DCAD ration combined with either colocalciferol or uh, high D. So again, here, like I showed in the, the previous slide, cows that were fed the, the high D had a greater uh, production of milk, four kilograms greater milk per day compared with cows that were fed the colocalciferol. In the same experiment, we also measured the concentrations of 25-hydroxy-D in serum. So just like I showed in previous slides, feeding the high-D is much more effective at increasing serum 25-D compared with feeding colocalciferol. We also measured concentrations of calcium in serum and phosphorus in serum. Even though we did not see a, a difference in feeding uh, of feeding high D and postpartum calcium, there was an effect of feeding high D and prepartum calcium and phosphorus. Also, you will see that uh, by feed, combining high D with the negative DCAD prepartum ration, we had a much greater improvement in postpartum calcium by feeding the negative DCAD ration in the prepartum. If you look at the uh, results on the bottom in the table, you will see that uh, by feeding high D, we also had greater calcium that is produced in the colostrum, and we had a greater colostrum yield. And likewise, for uh, the amount of uh, of calcium that was in the uh, urine and in the uh, uh, their calcium balance. Now, very importantly, in the next slide, I show the effects of feeding high D with a negative DCAD on incidence of postpartum diseases. So in this slide, you'll see on the left in the table are the incidences of retained placenta, hypocalcemia, metritis, and subclinical hypocalcemia. In this experiment, we saw significantly less retained placenta in cows by feeding prepartum high D. We also saw significantly less 
incidence of metritis by feeding a high D prepartum. We did not see an effective high D on incidence of hypocalcemia, but I would like to point out that by combining prepartum high D with negative DCAD, we had uh, altogether fewer cases of postpartum diseases. In the next slide, uh, our data from an experiment we did with lactating cows where we fed either uh, control, which is one milligram of colocalciferol, or three milligram of high D during the lactating period. After feeding three milligrams of high D for 21 days, we fed the cows we, we challenged the cows with intramammary streptococcus hubris. You can see in the, the slide here showing mastitis severity after we challenged the cows that cows that were fed high D had decreased, uh, delayed uh, uh, onset of mastitis severity. Likewise, their rectal temperatures, which is an indicator of mastitis severity, were also decreased by feeding three milligrams of high D per day. We also looked at mammary immune responses. So although there was no change in the next slide, although there is no change in the somatic cell score, we did see that there's an increased abundance of neutrophils in milk for cows that were fed three milligrams of high D compared with the control. This would suggest that perhaps cows fed the high D had a uh, increased uh, uh, capability to recruit neutrophils to the mammary gland to get rid of the infection. Thank you, Luis. Ok, Corin, muito obrigado pela sua participação. É sempre muito bom escutar a, a, de você a sua experiência e o conhecimento a respeito do de, de vacas leiteiras. Eu sei muito sobre dairy cows e vitamina D suplementação. Muito bem, dando sequência. Então, muito bem. Moving on now. Deu continuidade ao We conducted these studies and we continued the research we started in Florida in two different studies here in Brazil and a partnership with the Federal University of Lavras. So we have two pieces of research that were very robust here as well. That was conducted by Dr. Max Pereira. And here I, he I bring a summary of everything we found in these two studies in the University of Lavras. The first is 25 hydroxyvitamin D in serum showed higher levels. So we have two more studies that show that when you use high supplementation, you can reach higher levels of 25 hydroxy D3 in serum. And also you can increase calcium content, the calcium in serum, both total and ionized. You also led to higher milk yield, so leading to 0.7 grams kilograms per day. But if you think about milk that is well fat corrected milk, we see a 1.3 kilogram increase per day, which is a great result for farmers. And we also see difference in fat content. But what's important here for us now is that it reduced metric cell count, reinforcing what Corey has just said. High D improves the immune response in these animals. Just to talk a little bit more about the results we uh, in milk yield. This graph shows an experiment that was conducted in Lavras in which we found that after the 40th day of uh, lactation here in Penk, you can see an increase of milk production. And in the total period of 84 days, it led to 700 milligrams of milk extra. But in this period in the graph, you can see even more than that, probably, if you count all the spirit. And it's important to mention that these cows started with 230 days of lactation. So that's why we found 
this lower rates than we saw in other studies. However, there was a second study that will be published to this year, 2020, that was conducted in partnership with Embrapa, with Dr. Pacheco, and we also found a similar results to what we found in Florida, increasing uh, milk production in almost two liters a day. And here we have more details of the parameters and the benefits that we found in our studies testing high D against controlled diets with regular vitamin D in which intake was not changed, but milk yield and fat corrected milk yield increased with higher fat content and a reduction in somatic cell count. So here we have a very robust experiment in Brazilian universities showing that high D works really well in Brazil and Latin America as well. Very well. So now we are moving on to a second topic that is the benefits of high D for feedlot cattle, for beef cattle. To talk a little bit more about that, I'd like to invite now Professor Mario Higoni, who is a great partner of us and he is from the University of the State University of São Paulo, and he helped us in some of our studies in uh, feedlot cattle. Welcome, Mario. Oh, good evening. Thank you all for being here today. I'd like to also thank the other speakers. I'd like to thank Luis and Julian and all Tortuga and DSM teams. And I'd like also to thank the cooperation of Dr. Danilo, Dr. Sinchman, and all the students in our area, in our department, who help us, helped us in these studies. Well, this partnership with DSM and Tortuga is something that uh, is always looking for it returns on investments and to improve profitability in our sector. So I think that this partnership is very important and has been very fruitful. We have developed several advancements and we I'll be showing you some of the results from our studies. But first, I'd like to uh, mention something that I think is very important about feedlot cattle, that is how we choose the biological model, that means the genetic group that we're going to work with. Usually here we work with Nilor cattle that is a challenging group. There are different lineages, there are different breeds. We can select different genetic codes, so we see a lot of diversity in the cattle, but we see that we, what all of them want to achieve is muscular growth. And we might have to discuss a little bit more about the characteristics of confinement in each of these cases. But first, I'd like to present two aspects of this. The first one is that feedlock involves the finishing operations of the cattle, that is, we want to increase uh, meat production. And this has changed due to the challenges that feedlot opera operations face. So finishing operations become the, the moment where we can address the use of resources, of inputs, so that we can set the price of our product. So we have to adopt uh, technologies and methodologies that uh, meet the demands of feedlot operations. We have to prepare animals for that as well, so that we can discuss the stages of growth and muscle development. So one of the indicators that we use uh, very often is the carcass, the amount of carcass, and that's when um, we can talk about one of the major features, maybe a great opportunity we have to manipulate to this carcass, and that is done through the genes, the genes that regulate muscle development. I hope I was able to be clear to you, but this is what is important when you talk about feedlot operations. 
So we have here two different stages. The first one is fetal programming in, with the hyperplasia stage in which we modulate gene expression, we modulate the satellite cells so that we can produce more muscle fibers. Here you can see on the slide how that comes to be. But we have a second stage later on that takes place with anaplasm, with the muscle development and the parts, with hypertrophy. So we have two different moments in which we see and we have been trying to address these problems in our research to bring innovative solutions to build these problems and we can find responses, we can find new solutions for farmers. So hyperplasia is very important. We have been studying that more thoroughly. We have been trying to manipulate fetal programming, but we also have to look into the second stage, how we can increase muscle growth later on during finishing operations or a little more finishing operations. So here is the response we were looking for in our experiment. So we work with Nilor cattle. And what we found in our studies is that gene expression, especially those that were connected to protein synthesis and anabolism, increased in, uh, in after being supplemented by HIDI. So we saw an increase in anabolism, muscle anabolism, uh, with higher gene expression of IGF-1, IGF-2, and mTOR, which are genes that regulate anabolism. These results let us to understand, and, well, this re these results actually uh, come from 120 Nilor steers that were distributed in 25 for pans, five animals per pan, with treatments, for, uh, control treatment with zero milligrams, and two treatments with one milligram or three milligrams. The first thing that we try to analyze with uh, regards to gene expression is that we can see levels of response that are very uh, low, very low impact. And this is something we can see here as well. We saw that with the cattle. We can see here as well again. You see that both 25-hydroxy and calcium and phosphorus, they responded here according to the amount of supplementation. This is something that was very important to us so that we could discuss the following results. First, we had to guarantee that this supplementation would be metabolized, and it was. Now, showing the performance data, what draw uh, caught our, our eye here, and this is something that would confirm our hypothesis, is that we see important responses, especially in the dressing percentage and hot carcass weight, so we see here that actually the difference between the control and the high D is one percentage point, not 0 0.5 as you see here in the slide. And you see that it reaches, so with high D, one is of 56.9, not 56.4 as we see in the bars below. But you see that the dressing percentage was much higher because we had higher muscle content, and this helps us understand that maybe a probable strategy to finish cattle that get to the feedlot with lower weight, if you want to increase muscle content, you want to increase dressing percentage, is to feed them with high D. This is a very promising result. We understand that there are other factors to be taken into consideration, but these are great results. I think that this partnership will be fruitful in the future as well. We will have many more studies to with different topics so that we can keep on challenging and find other associated uh, 
so that we can increase the response of high D so that it can be consolidated as one of the greatest uh, supplements in cattle diet. With this brief presentation, I'd like to uh, hand the uh, microphone back to Luis Fernando because well, he will be able to tell us uh, to go through the PhD this research that are being developed and will be developed in the Innovation Center of Tortuga and DSM. Luis, so please, uh, the floor is yours again. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here, and I'll be available if anyone have any questions later on. Thank you very much, Mario. Excellent presentation. It was great to see these results. These results are very promising, very encouraging, and they show us concrete numbers on how this supplement can benefit beef cattle. And with that, uh, uh, just like with dairy cattle, we also continued the research we had conducted with beef cattle as well. So continuing the study that we started with Professor Mario at NASP, we had additional research in our research center now. So what you see now are some of the pictures of our innovation center for feedlot cattle. It's a center in Mato Grosso do Sul and uh, the center of Brazil. So it was an experiment design that used the top-notch technology of feedlot operations. I'll be showing two of our greatest results. So the first one, as you can see here, with we have the individual consumption and individual weight that is completely automatized so that we can have a very robust experiments and robust results here so that we can trust the results we have. In this experiment, we had crossbred animals. So we analyzed it for 105 days with crossbred animals and a highly energetic diet with 55% of starch, and we compared a traditional diet with monensin that is largely used in feedlot operations in Brazil. But we replaced monensin for crana and rumstar, that is anamylase, and uh, essential oils. And the third treatment was high, a supplement of high D with, associated with crana and rumstar. And what we found in our study is that the average daily gain was higher both in the two treatments with Crane Star. But what's mostly interesting here is that the carcass weight gain and the final carcass weight was higher the high day. So if you see here the final live weight uh, the carcass sorry weight with 369 kilograms with high D compared to 343 in monosim is a significant difference. It's a significant difference. Why? Because it's the carcass weight that makes a profit. And consequently, the average daily gain for the carcass was also higher with high D when compared to monosim. And with that, we also have a very interesting result that is aligned with what Dr. Mars said, that is the dressing percentage. So in the dressing percentage, we see 57.38% of dressing when the cattle was supplemented with high D, compared to 553 were cattle fed with monensin. So we see that both carcass weight and dressing percentage were better for high D, leading to much higher profits for the farmer. We then conducted a second study in our center of experimental feedlot. Now we have 140 steers with 14 pens, 7 pens per treatment with 10 animals per pen. So it was a very robust design in which we tested the control diet and the high D supplementation. And what we found here was really interesting as well because live 
No, the carcass weight increase 4.2 kilograms only by adding high D with vitamin E. That means that once again, we see very significant results showing the benefit of high D in weight gain and in the final carcass of these animals. But we went beyond that. We decided to conduct a study on the benefits of high D in semi-confinement, which is very common in Brazil, Paraguay, and other countries. So we had protein diet with a 1.4% of live weight consumption intake during 33 days. And after 33 days, we treated these um, animals, 40 animals, with high D in a second phase. This was also a robust study with five pans per treatment, 10 different pans showing interesting results. These results show an average daily gain that was much higher with high D, so leading to 105 grams of average daily gain. And the final carcass weight with seven kilograms in the group supplemented by high D through the total period. That shows that high D works well in feedlot and in semi confinement operations as well. We see significant results in both cases. Therefore, we have here, uh, I'd like to uh, summarize everything we have talked about for both dairy cattle and beef cattle, concluding that high D first drives higher yields and profits for farmers. High D in beef cattle boosts myogenesis and muscle cell hypertrophy, that is, leads to more muscle development, more meat, more carcass. It also promotes gene expression, and that's why it leads to higher, car uh, more carcass, and it lowers the incidence of metabolic disorders, just like dairy cattle. In the case of dairy cattle, it raises the 25 hydroxyl levels in serum. It increases milk yield. And we had 700 grams in lavas, but two gra kilograms more daily production in uh, in Brapa. So the first slide showing that animals that are healthy produce more and better was confirmed in our studies, in our scientific research. So all that shows that high D is an innovative technology that has come to stay and will change the market when thinking about meat and milk production. With that, I have a very important question for you. Okay. Very well. So how can we bring that to our own context? Well, we have the sustainability platform because a productive system that is actually efficient is also more sustainable and considers longevity and high performance. And the final question is, farmers, how can that arrange the farmers, because we see that high D is used in very low levels. We were talking about one milligram for dairy cattle and three milligrams for uh, preparing cows. We're talking about milligrams, not grams, so we need very low levels. Farmers cannot do, control this doses in the farm, so how can you use that? Well, you can use ID with uh, products that are now being launched by Tortuga here in Brazil. We have two different products that are completely innovative and these technologies. The first one is the one you see here that is the Bob Gold Prepartum Plus. This is a mix of minerals, vitamins, and additives where high D is used and is an extremely important additive that improves all the results that we have shown you. This product contains 
all the technologies that are now available for prepar now it leads to all the benefits we showed to you in this these slides and it's really easy to use this product is recommended for eight to ten percent in the feed that is being given to prepare of cows or 300 grams for per cow per day and that will lead to all the benefits that for the cow with great professional value. And we think about returns on investment, so we want the technology to be profitable, right? Considering all the benefits we talked about dairy cattle, milk yield, reduction in mastitis, reduction in metritis, increase in the immune response, all and reduction of somatic cell count, if we count think about all these benefits and we consider for example the Brazilian scenario in a conservative scenario of the price of milk of 1.3 reais per liter the return on investment would be 7.3 for every real invest so every time we invest one real this technology brings 7.3 reais back and in the case of confinement of feedlot, we have the same thing. With high D, it is very similar to above gold. We have false bulby with our minerals, our vitamins, in great levels of fermentation, replacing uh, the use of antibiotics, amylase, and also high D and all the benefits that were presented here today leading to greater uh, daily weight gain and higher dressing percentage leading to a higher production of meat and the studies that we conducted considering these benefits and comparing it to uh, how we can uh, how we can make a profit here we and considering the prices we have in the markets we saw that the profitability of ID in feedlot operations was well co when compared to traditional feedlot operation of higher profits in 95 days of in 4.38 percent in 95 days of confinement that means 64 actually uh, 64 4.6 percent to higher profitability because we went for 17.7 to 3 to 7.9 in the carcass weight. Okay, so 19.7% higher carcass uh, dressing percentage. So those farmers who invest in Foswavi will have higher profits in their operations. With that, I'd like to thank you all, and I will be showing you a last video so that we can go for the Q&A. Thank you very much for being with us all this time. If you've struggled with the calcium gap in your herd, you know that calcium management isn't always easy. Most dairy cows will experience the calcium gap at some point, and the gap is significant. In the first nine weeks of lactation, a cow may have a calcium deficit of 10 grams per day. Active vitamin D has all sorts of functions in the lactating cow. Calcium and phosphorus absorption, skeletal development, and immune regulation. There are two basic ways that you're probably using to make sure your animals get the vitamin D they need to maintain productivity and health and get the calcium they need. Sunlight, of course, is a great source of vitamin D, but it's not enough by itself. Most dairy nutritionists and producers also use a D3 supplement to help keep their animals healthy. This has been the most effective solution for some time. It's likely that you haven't even considered alternatives because there are so many other pressing issues for today's dairy producer. Stop for a second and consider how well this strategy is working for your herd. If you're still experiencing a calcium gap and see a high percentage of your cows leaving the herd within the first 60 days of lactation, the measures you're using may not be enough. High D solves the issues that plague generic D3 supplements. High D is a proprietary vitamin D metabolite called 25-OH-D3 that offers a new solution for calcium management. Data shows that it supports immune health, milk production, and works better than vitamin D3 alone. 
and it's generally recognized as safe, GRAS, by regional experts for use in animals. In order to work, vitamin D3 from the skin or from the diet must first be processed by the liver before moving to the kidneys. In this process, the liver can act as a bottleneck. While D3 is converted to its active form, the outcome is that your dairy cows may experience a calcium gap. The difference with high D is that it bypasses the liver and goes directly to the kidneys. This allows for a more efficient absorption and higher levels of calcium that your herd needs to maintain health and production. High D has been researched around the world and proven to be beneficial in multiple species. It's the only form of 25-OH D3 studied in the calcium metabolism of dairy cows. Close the calcium gap to support your milk production with High D. Please contact your DSM sales representative to learn more about High D. For Dr. Luis Fernando, as uh, a question that was asked actually by many people, High D and vitamin D is it the same thing? Oh, great question! And I'd like to thank everyone who asked that. This is an interesting question. It's a great question. Actually, thank you for asking about that because high D and vitamin D3 are not the same thing. Remember, I t showed you that vitamin D3, when it is synthesized by your skin or it is uh, received by dietary supplementation, goes through the liver, and in the liver, it is transformed in 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. That is high D. So you see, these are two different substances. They are not the same things. One is cocalciferol and the other one is 25 hydroxy cocalciferol. They are biologically different. But the second thing here is no, they are not the same because the animal responds differently to them. High D, when we show the experiments by Corey Nelson in Florida and the experiment in Lavras that I mentioned about feedlot and Embrapa, and in Onesti Botucatu, where we compared D3 with D3 plus high D, and in the experiments in uh, farms with feedlot cattle preparations, when we use high D, the response in the animal body leads to higher responses and higher immune, or higher performance and higher immune responses. So, no, vitamin D is one thing. 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 is a different thing. High D shows much better results than regular vitamin D. To complement that, I'd like to say that today we have over 20 studies that have been published with high D. In this presentation today, we mentioned 12 of them who that studied both dairy cattle and beef cattle. Twelve only mentioned today, but we have even more, and we have several research being, uh, several studies being published. Great. So the next question, I'd like to ask Dr. Corwin. We received this question from many different people. Many different people asked the same question. I mean, but basically, uh, we want to know more about the quality of the colostrum and the performance of calves. Does high D bring any benefits to the development of calves? Dr. Corwin? Can you translate the English for me? The question? Você pode passar a pergunta para mim em inglês? Claro. Eles perguntaram sobre a qualidade do colostro e como o Heidi pode melhorar essa qualidade do colostro e como ela pode impactar I will go back to this slide. Slide 
Acho que foi o slide... 26. 26. So, not only did we see increased colostrum uh, production of, by feeding high D, uh, we also had an increased concentrations of minerals in the colostrum. Uh, also, not shown in this slide, uh, but we also had increased IgG. So that will improve the amount of minerals and uh, immunoglobulins that are going to the calf by feeding the high D to the cows. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Bom, vamos para uma pergunta que eu quero. É, Let's move on to the next question that will be addressed by for Dr. Mario. What is the recommended period to use high D in feedlot operations? Well, Julia, we you, we tested this supplementation first from the very first moment when animals get to the feedlot operations, get to confinement, uh, that in animals, even though they have been finished for commercial use, the animals that we started working with were young nilor steers. They didn't have a high mus uh, muscle score, and they required uh, muscle growth so that we could actually lead to a to actually we could develop we had to develop better diet so that we could lead to this muscle development but we started testing these cat these uh, steers when they first arrived in the finishing operations mm, okay so throughout the whole confinement period okay i see i think we have a good question here for luis fernando I use Tortuga products and I see good results in transition period. So what, how can high D uh, bring extra benefits in this period? Oh, that's another great question because knowing that this person already uses our products during the transition phase that is the prepartum period we're talking about anionic diets it means that we are preparing the cow for calving so we have conducted research in prepartum scenarios comparing anionic and cationic diets with high d and without high d we did that in Florida, we did that in Brazil, and what did we find? Well, we found that high D improves anionic diets. So besides all the benefits that you get from the anionic diets, the, and it also leads to higher milk yields. But I think the greatest benefits is that we know that anionic diets is, are, are better than cationic diets. And anionic diets associated with high D are even better than anionic diet with regular vitamin D3. So you get all the benefits that you already have with your anionic diet with the preparing control, and you add to that all the benefits that we mentioned here today with the use of high D. Okay. Great, Luis. Thank you very much. We also have a few questions here about the studies that were conducted, well, and they were shown here as well. We will be sending you all the, the studies for those of you who asked that, but uh, I'd like to remind you all that this presentation will be available in the link that you have for over a year. So for those of you who weren't able to see all of it now or who have questions and would like to listen to it again, it will be made available to you in this link. You can access it later on. And this is something that some people were asking me about. Well, I have a next question here that uh, uh, well, you can open if you want. Knowing that uh, calcium levels reduce your, the, the 
formation of 125-dehydroxy vitamin D3. And the supplementation of this mineral or this availability in uh, Sears may lead to different results. Oh, okay, let me answer this one. This one I know how to answer. Okay, please do. Okay, so the levels of calcium in prepared on this uh, diet has always been a very controversial topic because in the mid 2000s, we saw this study that was published by an Australian researcher in which the meta analysis compiling all the studies that he conducted, he saw a result that was very curious in which calcium concentrations that were ideal for prepartum periods would be either very low levels, let's say below 0.5% or very high, around 1.5% of dry matter. And concentrations that we used to use 0.7 and 0.8 were associated with a higher incidence of hypocalcemia. And after years of that, over 10 years in which the dairy cattle industry didn't understand the role of calcium, and I'm saying that associated with acetogenic diets. Finally, two or three years ago, in the University of Florida, in the same university where Dr. Corey Nelson worked, some researchers, especially that of uh, especially José Eduardo, showed in a different meta-analysis that in the context of acidogenic diet that is, conduct, that is done properly with uh, minus 4 to minus 10 milligrams of uh, dry matter, I mean normal, regular acidogenic diet, the benefit of calcium is almost irrelevant. So contrary to everything we believed in the past, and in the context or in operations that make use of acidogenic uh, diet, is the concern with calcium prepartum periods not as relevant as we used to believe. So this is something that I wanted to share with you. I believe that that answers to the question of our colleague. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rodrigo. Now I have one more question for Dr. Mario. How can HID optimize carcass production in feedlots? Well, considering our studies, we needed to find signals in gene expression, especially some specific signal factors that result as shown in the dressing percentage and everything, especially when we talk about the conversion of kilograms in the carcass as shown. So here, this is the response that we saw for feedlot cattle. But I want to make clear that we didn't know how many cells would be hypertrophied once there is no hyperplasia anymore in these situations. So here, maybe we should investigate whether we could uh, act on muscle fibers, because we know that usually this impacts the visceral organs and everything, but what actually caught our eye in our studies was the gene expression in, well, we had several different studies mapping genes, and we chose these that is to summarize only the fact that we have seen of high D in protein synthesis and in muscle synthesis. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mario. And now we have a question from Bruno, by Bruno from Revista Rural. He's asking us if in using high D and using the supplement, how long 
does it take for the farmer to see a difference in performance in their animals? Okay, I'll start uh, uh, answering that, but I think that Mario, Corin, Rodrigo can also talk about that. I think this is a very great question because it depends. It depends on your operation. So, for example, if you're talking about prepartum cows in the transition period, so 21 days of calving, you can see the benefits of the supplementation immediately after calving. Of course, it of cows are different, so we see different benefits that will be seen uh, throughout the days after cap. So it depends on when you start, but of course when you talk about feedlot operations, it will be at the end of the feedlot operation. So as we start supplementation in the first day of the finishing operations, and when and during the slaughter you will see great results. And we also have some studies that were conducted with heifers and calves that show other results. I'd like to have Mario, Rodrigo, and Coring to add to that, maybe considering the studies that you have conducted. Okay, I can start then. But Luis, I agree 100% with what you have already said. That's it. For dairy cattle, we are talking about prepartum supplementation in three, four weeks before calving. And when you associate high D with acidogenic diet, the benefit will be seen after calving. And these benefits will extend throughout lactation. Because as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, a cow that starts lactation period better with higher calcium levels will yield more milk, will have a reduced incidence of disease, so you see the benefits during calving. Well, let me see if I understand the question, because from what I see, uh, this is sort of a tricky thing. Uh, I think people want to understand actually strategies of supplementation and the time for response when you start using height. As you said, when we started supplementing the cattle in the, in the first day of finishing operations, but you can only assess that, of course, during slaughter to when we analyze the carcass. But I want to talk to you a little bit about muscle development throughout the finishing operation in three different moments of assessment. So when we think about the centimeter, centimeter square of muscle that were developed after the use of high supplementation. This is a technology that has been used today, showing great results. And with that, we would be able to assess muscle growth throughout the finishing operation. And then, if uh, we were able to do that, we would be able to create new strategies of supplementation. I don't know if that's what the person wanted to understand, but what we can do is, what I can say is that to create strategies, we would have to do that. Great. I don't know if anyone else would like to say anything, but we have here a few questions as well, talking about uh, the stability of Heidi. Some people are concerned because many people say that vitamin is not as stable in the diet. So, Luis, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, that's another great question. Oh, I'd like to thank those of you who have asked that because, yes, there's a concept that vitamins are not stable, especially vitamin A, vitamin E. These are thermostable or photosensitive compounds. But there is an important point here. VSM works as the world leader of vitamin implementation, and one of our expertise, one of the things that is most important about our company is that we develop 
formulations and systems that treat the vitamins so that they become more stable. So we protect the vitamin so that they don't decay and they maintain their stability and mineral mixes or premixes or vitamin supplementations or even in pellet feed. And that's the case of high D. High D is formulated in a way that it protects it from any uh, thermosensitivity, photosensitivity, and other problems. So high D is a stable product that can be used in your mixes and it can it's used even in pellet feed. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of questions as well about the use of high D for cat, beef cattle that is raised in the pasture. What can you tell us about that? Uh, that's another good question, yes. Well, first, we have a promising future, a very promising future. Today we have proved that high D works well in dairy cattle, in feedlot cattle, in set beef cattle that is raised in semi confinement bringing great returns on investment so again it's technology that will change the market it's a game changer definitely so today high d works very well in finishing operations and well both in early uh, finish operation and late finish operation for long periods we're talking here about 90 days 100 days of supplementation so it's not a product that uh, after some time uh, starts to lose efficacy. No, no, no. We maintain efficacy throughout long periods. Now, considering what Mario and Diego said about gene expression and the ability to stimulate the myogenesis and hypertrophy, we can now talk about the promising future of ID. Why is that? Well, because we are considering studying the effect of high D supplements in pregnant cows to program the fetus. So this is the next step to prove that high D can be even better than it is today when we supplement the cows, preparing calves that haven't even been born yet, to stimulating gene expression and creating new carcass structures that can lead to higher daily gains. So today, high D is very good, but it will be even better in the future. Great, thank you very much. And now, considering that question, we have a few people who asked us that uh, he, don't have this anabolic effect. What is the impact of anabolic effect, or how can the market, the European market, that is the most demanding one, uh, face the use of this product, this anabolic effect that it has, that it promotes? Uh, yeah, that's another interesting thing to talk about because, yes, it has this characteristic this feature that promotes anabolism. But it's not uh, uh, an analyzer. We're talking about vitamins, okay? Even though uh, we have to remember that vitamin D is not a hormone, it is a vitamin. So hormone effects are different from those of vitamin, and 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 is not a hormone, it's a vitamin. But it's a very powerful vitamin. And yes, it leads to anabol anabolic benefits, which is very promising for us, actually. It brings performance benefits that are very significant, but not only that, yes, but it's not a hormone, but it leads to very powerful results in that area. Okay, we have another very specific question for Dr. Rodrigo asking, what is his experience in the in metritis in Brazilian farms? What is the incidence of metritis in Brazilian 
thoughts on how it has been handled uh, through and addressed through nutrition. Okay, so thank you very much for your question. Well, what we have been doing to monitor that is, well, we can say we conduct indirect monitoring because we understand that cows with uh, a mineral metabolism that is favored in early lactation, especially due to the effect of calcium in smooth muscle cell, this effect of calcium in these smooth cells in the uterus will promote the incidence of metritis. So even though I am a veterinary, my research is conducted in uh, considering nutritional values. So to be honest here, I believe that we observe now that Cows that have a calcium status that is higher in emitted postpartum see lower incidences of metritis and other diseases, both metabolic disorders and infection. But if we want to, well, monitoring metritis in farms is not my research, but maybe we can ask I know the Corrine also monitored that in his experiments. I can ask him that. If, do you want me to do that? Sure. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, of course. Hi, Corrine. Uh, it's a question related with uh, how can you, if you can give us some input in the nephritis incidence and how you can, if you can describe something in your work that uh, related to the high D supplementation and the metritis incidence in the herds that you have monitored. I don't know if you got it. Yes, uh, okay. yes. Thank you. So uh, there's two possible ways. One is that uh, because high D increases the prepartum calcium, perhaps there's more calcium there to stimulate the immune system. The other is that Vitamin D works directly in immune cells. So by providing high D, you increase the amount of, of vitamin D that immune cells are able to use. Therefore, that could provide a more robust immune response against pathogens that would cause metritis. Okay, right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to continue with you, Dr. Então, agora Corwin. Eu gostaria de continuar uh, com você, Dr. Corwin. How do you think it's Como? the next steps of the, the research with Heidi? Yes, thank you. The next steps uh, of, of research. Uh, one is uh, uh, what happens for long-term feeding. You know, many of the trials that we've done are focused on just the transition period. So we're also looking at what happens with, uh, can this be fed over a long term? Um, uh, we have some ongoing research with that now. Um, and it, it looks very promising. Uh, we also need to still continue to optimize the amount. Um, the data that we show so far is three milligrams per day is uh, increases milk production for transition cows. Um, but we still need to, to optimize the amount. And then also understand more about how it acts not only in immune cells, but also how it acts in the mammary gland and, and in reproductive tissues. Thank you. Estamos chegando aqui, centenas de perguntas. É, uma que foi bastante Just feita também. One that was also for, asked very often here today, today that will be sent to Professor Mario, is about the age of animals in confinement and also the breeds, if that may interfere results. Well, I think that when we think about the 5 million uh, heads of cattle in confinement, of course, we have different uh, 
uh, figures, Daniel has shown very accurately that uh, we see an increase in that country. But what we know that that we mostly use the lower braids here, and then a cast rate of angle. Of course, here we have to have just an overall view here because, of course, uh, different places we use different breeds, right? And uh, the cattle that uh, gets to the to the feed lot, well, it varies a lot, and these variations will reflect on how you conducted the uh, diets and the protocols to adapt to these animals as well. So, so I think. Uh, this is an important thing to mention and something we have to address, we have to debate, we have to challenge because these are animals that come, they usually get to the feedlot operations at young ages, maybe 20 months, talks in most of the Midwest of Brazil, and others maybe may get to the fit a lot of persons at 24 months of age and have uh, shorter uh, finishing operations. So we have to uh, see how we can increase the fat content because and this is also another variable that uh, can, has to be taken in consideration when you think about growth and finishing. We have maybe to consider that the uh, muscle weight in these animals may change according to the age. If we have younger animals getting to the finish operations compared to a older, so the efficiency will vary and we have to analyze, of course, how this efficiency matches the profitability. But to do that, we have to understand that we it's a challenge to analyze all these different breeds and we have to see that the younger the animal the the greater the difference in the results and the market now wants us the carcasses that have higher dressing percent that have more meat so we have to take that into consideration when we think about our operations as well okay great i well i'd like to thank you all for your questions. Unfortunately, we cannot address all of them, but we will be sending you all the answers. All of you who have put your emails will be receiving the uh, answers. And I'd like to thank Dr. Luis Fernando for conducting this presentation and Professor and Dr. Rodrigo, Dr. Corey, and Dr. Manuel. Well, thank you all very much for this presentation today. We have been here for over almost two hours but thanks to you who asked so many questions and asked and got us to explain even further what we we're talking about i'd like to remind you all that all of those who want to get to know this technology starting tomorrow can talk to the sales representative of Trooper, that is a dsm brand all of this will be all the information of this these products will be available to you starting tomorrow. Okay, so thank you very much. Have a good evening. And this presentation is recorded and you can get back here and rewatch it if you want. Okay, thank you very much and goodbye.